Hello, hello, testing. Looks like it's working, right? Yeah, it is working. Okay, let's get started, guys. So, welcome to the first class of the physics of radiation oncology. Do you want one of these lights, though? Yeah, please. It's, uh... Okay. So, uh, again, I'll be recording the lecture. You'll be seeing the PowerPoints and my voice, voice embedded on there. So, don't feel compelled to, to take a lot of notes. I'd rather you think about the material, and I know hopefully you've pre-read the material so you have a little bit of a, a familiarity with what we're going to talk about. And I want you to kind of cogitate as I talk and ask questions. I want this to be more of a discussion class than just me up here just talking about radiation physics, okay? It'll be boring for you. It'll be boring for me. So let's make this a discussion stop at any time. Uh, I know, Josh, you already had a couple of questions about the nuclear physics part, and my answer to that was some of the material we weren't, we're not going to delve deep into the nuclear physics part, and that's usually a nuclear physics course that takes care of that. And we're gonna, some of the stuff we're going to skim over, it's just material that it is, it will be more of a review to you folks, or more of a, maybe just a qualitative understanding rather than an in-depth understanding, okay? Because there's so much material to cover in radiation physics uh, that I want to get to everything, okay? So let's get going. So in today's discussion, we're going to talk about basic units. I think this will be uh, this will be a probably a primer or a review for you folks uh, because of your physics background. So we're going to talk about basic units. We're going to be talking about the makeup of atoms and radioactivity. What is radioactivity and, and stability uh, of atoms? And also decay modes. We're going to get into more detail in the decay modes part. Okay, a couple of links of interest, and when you run this PowerPoint, you can click on these links. And the first one is information about general information about radiation for the public. And that's published by the International Agency, let's see, International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. And it's a great little synopsis about radiation, the health effects, the dangers, uh, that kind of thing. It's just an overview. Then the second link is a set of medical physics slides, and um, it's an overview of, of medical physics concepts. The third one is a medical physics handbook. And this book is, um, it's not a, it doesn't go again, it doesn't go in depth. It's a handbook like the title describes it. You just have to go in there and see what it is. It's basically a list of formulas and some narrative in there on how to use the formulas. And the last one is a table of isotopes. This is a nice little application that you can, it's kind of like a periodic table like this. And, uh, and you can click on it. It gives you all kinds of information about the isotopes, the radioactive isotopes within each element. Okay, So it's a nice little app. Okay, so starting in units and conversions. AMU, you've probably all, all, all heard of AMU, atomic mass unit. One AMU is equal to the weight of carbon-12. And, you know, I always, I always get the question, do I need to memorize this? Yeah, this kind of stuff you need to know. Okay, so, so this you'll need to know. Obviously, you'll always have access to this uh, in, your, in your work and in the rest of your life. But it's always good to know, to have an idea of, of uh, the, um, the general size of these units. So an AMU is a weight of carbon-12 divided by 12, okay, which is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilos. And then Avogadro's number, famous number, 6.0228 times 10 to the 23 atoms per gram atomic weight. Okay, now grams per atom, all right, so now if you have, if you have an Avogadro number of carbon, how much does that weigh? So I've got, I've got this many, oh, I should have brought my pointer. You know what, it's even better than my pointer at mouse because it gets recorded. So I've got this many atoms of carbon, atoms, how much does that weigh? I've got this in my hand, how much, how much does that weigh? It weighs 12 grams, okay? So say I have that many, what's oxygen? Oxygen, oxygen 16, right? So if I have that many, that many uh, atoms of oxygen, I have 16 grams of oxygen. I have 16 grams. I'm holding 16 grams, okay? So Avogadro's number is a way, is a, is a number that, that uh, represents the number of atoms that you need to, to come up with the weight of a particular atom, okay? So now, how, how many grams per atom? Number of grams per atom is equal to the atomic weight. And again, the atomic weight, for example, in carbon-12 is 12, okay? So it's the atomic weight divided by Avogadro's number, okay, so you don't use atomic weight. Now, the, and that's how you determine the number of grams per atom. The number of electrons per gram 
is equal to z, and z is atomic number. Okay, so the atomic number for carbon is six. It's usually half of. For the higher higher value atoms, it's always uh, the atomic the atomic number is, is less than half of the total atomic weight. But for the smaller numbers, it's uh, it's about half. And the atomic number is equal to the number of protons in the nucleus, right? Okay. So uh, the electrons per gram is equal to the atomic number, the number of protons in the nucleus, times Avogadro's number divided by the atomic weight of the element. That's the number of electrons per gram, and that kind of makes sense because this is the number of this is the number of um, atoms per gram, okay? And then z is actually the number of protons, but it's also the number of electrons in a stable in a stable element. The number of electrons and the number of, of protons is the same. Okay. Energy, some energy conversions. One electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the nine, minus 19 joules. Okay, that's a conversion between joules and electron volts. You'll probably, well, you, you'll be using electron volts a lot more than joules in this in this uh, uh, in this course, just because electron volts is more um, more appropriate for radiation physics. What's that number? Also, this is an, another number that means that represents something else besides the energy conversion. Come on. Right, it's the electronic charge. It's the it's the amount of charge in coulombs that an electron holds. Okay, and then m sub zero, you'll see that a lot, and that's equal to the electron rest mass. That's really small. It's amazing how somebody actually weighed an electron. Uh, Nine point one times ten to the minus thirty one kilo, uh, kilograms. And then the next formula is Einstein's formula of relativity, and it's equal to so e sub zero, the energy of a of an electron at rest is equal to the mass of the electron at rest times the speed of light squared. Okay, so just work putting those, plugging those numbers into the equation, you get 9.1 times 10 to minus 31 times speed of light squared. You end up with this many joules. So if you use units of kilos and meters per second, you end up with joules. Okay, so you end up with joules. Then we're going to use this conversion up here. Whoops. This energy conversion up here, 1 eV is 1.602 times 10 to minus 19. Apply it to this, and we end up with 5.511 MeV per electron. So that's how much energy an electron has at rest. Okay, we use the, the relativistic conversion. Okay, and the question at the bottom. Can you guys tell me how much energy 1 AMU contains? How would you do that if you had to calculate that? So you've got one AMU. What's the mass of an AMU? Right, it's at the top. Okay. So we take we take that value, multiply by speed of light squared, and you end up with a much a bigger number than this one. Right? Yeah. Okay. Any questions there? Okay. Mass defect. Uh, mass defect is something. That has to do with the fact that if you take pro all the protons and neutrons and electrons that are in an atom, and you weigh them individually, you're going to get you're going to get a mass that is much greater than the mass of an atom of the of the uh, composition of all of those elements. And the reason is because some of that mass gets gets converted into energy. Okay, and that's the energy that holds the protons together. That's the strong force that holds. Uh, that holds a proton. So imagine protons, I mean, they're like charge, right? They're all positive. How do you get them? I mean, positive, positive, and positive, there's a, there's a repulsion force, right? You guys learned that in electricity magnetism. So how do you, how do you uh, overcome that repulsive force? You overcome it with, with the strong force. Okay, so that energy has to come from somewhere, and it comes, it comes from some of the mass that's, that's uh, formed by the, the neutrons and the, and the protons. And this is a potential well. You've probably seen this a million times in your quantum mechanics course. And what this what this represents this is a potential well for a proton. So if you have a proton approaching a nucleus, the uh, the potential energy of the proton as as it approaches, there's this repulsive force. So the potential energy increases, and at some point, uh, if it can overcome this repulsive force, it'll fall into a potential well, and it'll get stuck there with the by the by the strong force. So keep it there. Okay, but it has to overcome that. Okay, electron distribution. So, what are the? How do the electrons get distributed within the orbitals? So, just this is just a basic overview and review of how 
how this works. Electrons reside in orbitals around the nucleus at discrete levels. Okay, so if they weren't at discrete levels, originally they thought, well, how can an electron rotate around something and not lose energy? Because uh, it would just spiral down, right? Because it's got a negative charge and the protons are positive, and it would just spiral down to the middle. Well, it turns out that it doesn't lose energy because it resides in, a, in a, only a particular orbital. Okay, and and it can jump from from uh, orbital to orbital, and it loses energy in discrete discrete amounts, not continuous. So uh, no energy is gained or lost in an orbital, and the shells are named K, L, M, and O. Uh, K being the, the innermost shell, L being the second one, etc. And the number, of, the maximum number of electrons in each shell is just a simple value: two times n squared, and n is equal to one for K, n is equal to two for L, three for n, four for n, and five for O. Okay, that's the number of electrons. So what's how many electrons can you have in a K shell? In the K shell? Uh, two. 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 Okay, because n is two, n is one for K. So you can have two. In the L shell, you can have eight. eight. Okay? Simple. Okay, and then we're going to skip sections 1.9 and 1.10. Okay, so getting into radioactivity now. How first first of all, how is it discovered? So it's amazing that radio to me is amazing that radioactivity was discovered around the same time as X-rays. I mean, they, nobody had any idea about X-rays or radioactivity before, before 1895, and within two years they discovered these two amazing physical effects. So we're going to get into Röntgen uh, either next class or the uh, class after, but uh, today we'll just talk about radioactivity. So uh, Henri Becquerel here, he discovered. Let's see, let's see if I remember how this works. He was he was working with um, phosphorescent material, which is material that if you shine a light on it. It then phosphoresces, it glows afterwards. So he thought that this, he had this uranium, these uranium salts, and he would bring them out in the daylight, and then he'd bring them inside, and they would, they would glow. Okay, so he thought he needed daylight to make this stuff glow, to make this stuff um, emit radiation. Well, there were some many dark, there were many dark days, and he wasn't able to make, he wasn't able to impart enough sun radiation to this uranium to make it glow. Okay, so he took the uranium, and he put it away in a drawer, and in this drawer, he had photographic plates, but they were wrapped up. These plates were wrapped up in black, um, uh, you know, photographic plates are sensitive to sunlight or any kind of light. So if you don't wrap them, they'll get dark. So these plates are wrapped up. So he put the uranium and the plates in a drawer. Then he opened up the drawer and he noticed that the plates were dark. And he thought, how is that possible? I mean, he understood that if he would have, if he would have taken this uranium saw, exposed it to the sun, and, and now it's bright, glow, glowing, whatever color it is, and he puts it on the plate, that's going to expose the plate because it's bright. But this stuff wasn't glowing. Okay, it was dark. The uranium was dark. Then he puts it in the drawer with the plates wrapped up, and it still exposed it. So that's, that means that there was some kind of invisible, not visible, invisible radiation that was exposing the plates. And not only was it invisible, it was getting through the, through the black paper. Okay, so that's how, this, that's how radioactivity was, uh, was discovered. And anyway, and so let's talk about units again. Oh, you know what? This this ten ten here, this little ten, this little ten. I mean, this second ten should be the power. Okay, that should be the exponent of that ten. So there's a typo in that one. So right here. So uh, conversions between Curie and Becquerel's. Curie's, by the way, are the older unit of activity, and Becquerel is a more fundamental unit. It's the SI unit of activity. And one back, one back, it's more fundamental because a Becquerel is equal to a disintegration per second, um, and a Curie was not was just a, was just an arbitrary amount that uh, that they that they that they used. So the conversion between Curies, one Curie is actually a lot of radiation. One Curie is three point seven times ten to the power of ten Becquerels. Okay, it's a lot. Just to give you an idea, in radiation therapy, uh, the hottest source we use is a ten Curie source. Okay, it's a ten Curie source of iridium. 192, and it's used in, and it lives in this machine in a, in a, in a safe because it's so hot. And we only use it when we treat the patient. So the patient goes into a room, and this little tiny, it's actually a little tiny source like the size of a piece of rice, it's welded to a cable. And it works by pushing this cable out of the machine and into the patient, and it goes inside the patient and treats from inside. It's called brachytherapy, which means internal radiation. 
So this source goes inside the patient and stays there for approximately five, five to ten minutes. Okay, and that's their, that's her treatment. And she comes back for two other times and she's done. So you can imagine how hot the source is to be able to deliver this much radiation. And that's a 10 curie source. So that's that's the highest source that we use in radiation therapy. Okay, and it's only 10 curies. Only, I shouldn't say only. Okay, so anyway, he got half of the Nobel Prize for discovering radioactivity. And the other quarter went to Pierre Curie, and the other quarter went to Marie Curie. So, and uh, at the time, I can't recall what they, I think that they actually worked with him on, on this stuff. Okay, so that's, radio, that's how radioactivity was discovered. Now, why are radioactive, why are nuclides radioactive? Well, they're radioactive because they're, well, not because, well, they're radioactive, and we call them um, unstable when they're radioactive, because a stable atom is not going to, is not going to emit any kind of radiation. An unstable atom will emit radiation to become stable. So stability or lack of radioactivity exists at low atomic number, uh, Z typically Z less than 20, where Z is the number of protons. Okay, and where sorry, where Z is equal to the number of neutrons. So when, when the number of protons is equal to the number of neutrons, you probably have um, you do have stability. Okay? As Z increases the repulsive force in the nucleus overcomes the nuclear binding force. Okay, so as you get more and more protons packed into the nucleus, they're going to start pushing away from each other. The strong force isn't going to be strong enough to hold it, and it becomes unstable. Okay, and they need, to, they need to release some energy. So stability is improved when the number of neutrons and protons are even numbers. Okay, so this helps too. So this graph here, which is a chilly funny color here, but this graph here is a graph of stability and down on the x-axis is the number of protons, and on the y-axis is the number of neutrons. And if we go across the stable line, so all the, all the elements that are on this line are going to be stable. So the number of neutrons typically is greater than the number of protons up here in the bigger numbers. And uh, these, these are going to be only stable down here, or the number of neutrons is equal to the number of protons. Those are going to be stable down here. Okay. And here's the rule of thumb over to the left. Um, for proportion of z to n, not proportion, but the numbers of z to n, if z is odd and n is odd, it's the least stable. Okay? And the most stable is when z is even and n is even. Okay? Then a couple of other things on the slide you need to know is some definitions. An isotope, you've heard of isotopes, right? An isotope is an element. An isotope is usually a comparison. This is an isotope of that. Okay? So an isotope is um, usually... The same Z, so if something has the same Z, it has the same name, right? So um, anything, so say, I don't know, isotope, we could just pick something, isotope oxygen. Okay, so oxygen is 16, but if I have an oxygen 15, that's an isotope. It has the same Z because it has the same name, okay? So if the number of protons changes in an element, it's going to be called something else, okay? So if we have oxygen... 15 and oxygen 16, we have the same um, number of protons, but we have one less neutron. 15 is one less neutron. Okay? <clears throat> so those are isotopes of each other. So Z stays the same, but N changes. The number of neutron changes. An isotone is kind of the opposite. An isotone, it's going to have a different name. And by the way, the way, one way to remember this is P, P isotope. P stays the same, number of protons stays the same. Isotone, N. Number of neutrons stays the same, but P changes. Okay, so isotones are going to have different names. Okay, so isotone is going to be like carbon, um, uh, nitrogen and carbon could be isotones, for example, of each other. Okay, so uh, so N is going to change, but uh, but uh, but P sorry P is going to change on an isotope isotone, but N is going to be different. An isobar, both Z and N change. So those are some definitions. Examples of these, uh, same so isotopes, same P, different N. Again, uh, iridium-193 and iridium-192 isotopes, they have the same P, they have the same name. Um, uh, iridium-192 is used in radiotherapy. That's the one that I said has 10 curies. And then cesium-133 and cesium-137, again, those are isotopes, same name. Um, but they have different ones. One has four more. 133, 137. One has four more what? Neutrons. Neutrons. Okay. Uh, isotone, same N, different P. 
Example cesium-137, so that's an isotone. It has the same number of neutrons, um, but a different number of protons. So 137, this is 138, so it has one more something. It has one more uh, proton in this case. Okay. Then isobar, different P and different N, same atomic weight. Okay, so same atomic weight, so the 133 is going to be common here, but the name is going to be different. So it has the same number of nucleons, but one has uh, one more proton, the other one has uh, one more neutron. Okay, and then an isomer is the last definition you need to know. Isomer has the same number of protons, same number of neutrons, but it's in a different energy state. Okay, and that happens when uh, an isotope is decaying and it decays to a certain level. Uh, before it goes on to to a next level, so it's in a it's in a um, isometric state, and we'll discuss this in a minute. So, example of this is xenon one hundred thirty three metastable it decays down to xenon one hundred thirty three. Okay, radioactive decay. So now let's get into radioactive decay and the different decay modes. Any questions about those? That's pretty much review, right? You guys have heard all that stuff before. Okay. So let's get into the decay modes. These are these are methods of decay. This is how something releases energy. A radioactive substance will will uh, release energy through six of these six decay modes. Have you covered these in undergrad? These decay modes. Okay. So alpha decay uh, is the first one. Uh, what's an alpha particle? Who can remember what an alpha particle is? Two bound protons. Two what? Protons. Two bound protons. So two protons and two neutrons. It's two helium. It's a helium nucleus. Yeah. Two helium nuclei together, so two protons and two neutrons. It's pretty, pretty massive. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty massive particle, and uh, we see alpha, we see alpha particles in our lives. I mean, you've heard of radon contamination, right? Radon gas, and radon gas decays through alpha decay. Okay, so, and one danger of radon gas is that if you breathe this stuff in, it's got these heavy part, heavy radioactive particles that can interact with your, with your lung, and cause possibly cause cancer. Okay, so how does a how does alpha decay work? So we start with boy, I have to get a wireless mouse. We we start with a substance over here with a certain number of certain atomic weight and a certain number of uh, protons, and this decays through alpha decay. So the resultant substance is Y, and Y is going to have four less nucleons, and it's going to have two less protons, right? And then so Y plus, and here's the alpha particle right here. Okay, so that's the typical formula for alpha decay. Okay, neutron and proton numbers both, both decrease by two. And an example of, of that is, like I said, radon two, uh, sorry, radium-226 decays down to radon-222. So there's the four, the missing four, plus the alpha particle. Okay, and uh, radon has a half-life of 3.8 days, and what's the half-life of something? Remember the half-life? The of time for the material to, to decay. The amount of the amount of time for material to be half as radioactive as as a starting time. Okay. So radon takes three point eight days to decay to half half of its original activity, and that decays down to polonium two eighteen, and emits another alpha particle. Okay. So it's the danger with radon is that you can inhale these, and the kinetic energy of the radon two two six alpha is four point seven eight MeV. Okay, so it's got a little bit. It's got a little bit of uh, of a push. Okay, so it's going to have some velocity, and the range of alphas in air is two to ten cm in air. Okay, now uh, air is it, particles don't interact with air much because it's so sparse. There's not much in the air, right? It's just um, nitrogen, a little bit of nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Um, but if you took a piece of paper or your clothing, the alpha particle couldn't get through it. It's just too massive. Okay, the, the likelihood of it interacting with, with clothing or paper is, is high, so it doesn't get through it. Okay, alpha decay schemes. So you're going to see these decay schemes a lot. So let's learn about them. So um, uh, in a decay scheme, you usually see the parent, the parent element here, a parent radioactive element, and it either decays to the left or it decays to the right. Okay, if it decays to the left, that means that the parent is going to lose protons. Okay, or the protons are going to get converted to neutrons. Okay, so it's going to lose protons if it goes to the left, and it's going to gain protons if it goes to the right. Sorry, it's going to, it's going to lose neutrons if it goes to the right. Okay, so the radon 226 is going to decay down to, by the way, this is this 88 is, is Z, is the number of protons. 
The rate on 226 is going to decay through two possible ways. Okay, it's going to either decay through this alpha 1 particle or an alpha 2 particle. And you'll see on these decay diagrams uh, a percentage of probability, how probable that is to happen. All right, so which one's more probable, alpha 1 or 2? 1, okay, so 1 is much more probable, it's 94.5%. And the energy, and also it'll, it'll give you the energy of that alpha particle, 4.78 MeV. The energies look like they're similar, but this one will, have, will occur more often. All right, so what's the difference between this one and this one? This one decays to this metastable state. Remember the metastable state I was talking about? So what, is, what would this be called, this that thing? Remember this isotope, isotone? Iso what? Isomer? Isomer. Because it's, huh? My, my thought with isomers, even though it's has different energy, didn't it just lose? A proton and a new, multiple protons and neutrons? No, an isomer is the same number of protons and neutrons as the parent. It's just in a different energy state. So you're saying that Ra decaying to Rn is an isomer? Rn is an isomer. Oh, wait a minute. No, sorry. It isn't. Sorry, right. 222. No, it's not. Um, uh, an, isomer, an isomer would be if Ra decays to Ra in a metastable state. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Huh? Yeah. So that, that would be an isobar because we have different amount of protons and neutrons. Right. So you'd have so because of some the atomic No, it's neither. Atomic weights change, so it's not an isobar either. It's no. It is a both the protons and the neutrons change, so yeah, it'd be an isobar. But no, because the eighth doesn't stay the same. And an isobar ace that has to stay the same. So it's neither. Okay. <laughs> but from we can call it something. From 222 down, that's an isomer. It was in the scan at one. Yes. One These two are isomers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so the difference between these two is that this one drops to a state that's not fully down to the ground state. This is the ground state of, of this transition. This one drops to a state that's just before it and then emits a gamma. Okay, so as, as radium decays, it's mostly going to emit alpha particles, but if you have a detector that can detect alpha particles and distinguish between alpha particles and gammas, it's going to detect some gammas. Not that many, because that, that alpha 2 mode of decay is not that common. Okay, so it's not going to detect that many, that many gammas. Okay, next one. So since we were talking about radium, what are the practical uses of radium? And uh, in this course, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to kind of put it in perspective. When I talk about physics, I'm going to put it into perspective with with clinical aspects. So practical uses: one is brachytherapy, and I mentioned already what brachytherapy is. It's internal radiation. It's when we put radioactive materials inside the patient to treat the patient from the inside out. Uh, and so it's used. Radium, radium is is implanted in needles, and so this is. We don't do this anymore. But back in the old days when radioactivity was discovered and they realized that radioactivity had a biological effect. Okay, they would put, and the way it was first discovered that it had a biological effect is they would put it on, uh, on lesions, like there would be some lesion on a patient, they put it on there and they try to cure it. So they were mostly they would start with, uh, with superficial lesions because they saw that it had some kind of an effect on skin. So they would put it on skin and they'd see some reddening. Okay? Of course they didn't realize but that could also induce cancer. So a lot of people back then that used radium, including Mary Curie, uh, died of cancer because they didn't see that they didn't know that after effect. Kind of like smoking too. When people started smoking, nobody thought that they'd get cancer. So uh, then they started experimenting interstitially because people uh, they wanted to treat tumors, and they did that by putting radium inside these needles, and they would implant the needles in the patient. And they had these special rules and how they would implant them in terms of how far apart they were and how many planes of needles they would use to treat a, a volumetric tumor. So radium is no longer used due to the risk of leakage through the container. Okay, so if radium ever leaked and got out, then remember how radium decays down to radon? All right? And so radon is a gas, and that gas can get into the patient and into the biological systems, into your, into your uh, tissues. And that, could have, um, that can have all, all, terrible, all kinds of terrible effects. So due to, this leak, uh, due to this risk of leakage, they stopped using radium and um, and then and then the, another another bullet here. Remember, 
to know radon gas is also responsible for 80% of natural background radiation. All right, so where else do you see background radiation? Any of you guys know of a couple of other places, the sun and the sun. Pretty high energy gamma rays come from the sun that, that, uh, that reach the earth. Another one is our own. We have potassium inside of us. We have radioactive potassium inside of us. So that's another source of background radiation. But, uh, but anyway, radon gas is 80%. So that's a, that's a large component of background radiation. And the radiation levels around the country and around the world are different. Okay, so here in the Chicago area, we get about 300 millisieverts. And we're going to go into millisieverts uh, in a little while. And in some places, it's a lot higher than that. And the question is, does that background radiation, does that mean that people who live in areas that have a really high background radiation, do they, are they more susceptible to cancer? And the answer is no, we don't see that. Okay, so uh, there's, there's some suspicion that a little bit of radiation can actually uh, help you prevent cancer. It's called hormesis. Uh, all right, so radium-226 radium was eventually replaced with cesium-137, which is not as hazardous for medical use. All right, so number one, that was alpha decay. That's the first, first um, mode of decay we're going to cover. And the second one's beta decay. This is very common. Okay, so beta decay, an unstable nucleus, there's two types of beta decay. All right, so you guys have heard of electrons and you've heard of positrons, right? So there's two kinds of beta decay. So the first one, beta plus decay, which is uh, positron decay, uh, what happens in the nucleus during beta, beta plus decay? Well, the conversion of a proton in the nucleus, it gets converted to a neutron. Okay, and basically a neutron is like a proton plus an electron, right? So in the nucleus, a proton gets converted to a neutron. So it's like, the, it's like you're taking an electron and adding it to a proton and you're making a neutron. And it yields, it yields a positron and a neutrino. Okay, so beta decay. Um, here's the, this X is the, <clears throat> is the parent, parent element. And then it decays down to Y and you're losing the proton. So Z minus one, you have one less proton. Um, and then you're emitting a positron. Emitting a positron and a neutrino. Okay. And in beta negative and beta minus, that's when uh, beta minus is an electron. And an electron, what happens in the nucleus? Uh, a neutron gets converted to a proton. Okay, so that new that neutron loses its electron, okay, and it gets converted to a proton. <clears throat> so therefore, the parent element adds you you now have a new uh, new proton, which is really the conversion. From it. And A stays the same, by the way. The atomic weight stays the same in both of these because it's just a conversion process. Either a neutron converts to a proton or a proton converts to a neutron. And this first, and this first positron is emitted, this one an electron is emitted. And, and these, this is, people have tr trouble remembering these. People tend to think that a neutrino is emitted after beta minus decay, but it's really an antineutrino. Okay, so an antineutrino is emitted for beta minus decay and a neutrino is emitted for beta plus decay. Okay, no change in atomic weight, but Z increases in two, in process two, or it decreases in process one. Okay, and here's the spectrum. So as it emits these electrons and positrons, what's the energy of these emit electrons and positrons? It's important that we know the energy of these, uh, especially when it comes to, in our field, for radiation protection, um, for penetration. So we need to know how energetic these, these uh, betas are. So... This is a spectrum, and then I just kind of drew this. So beta particles are high-energy electrons. As you know, they're ejected in a spectrum of energies. Average energy is about a third of the maximum energy. Okay, so as these uh, radioactive elements decay, they emit positrons and electrons, and the energy, there's a maximum energy that exists for a particular disintegration, and then there's a spectrum of, of energies. Okay, and the energy of the neutrino, so say... Say the, uh, in one particular disintegration, it disintegrates with half of the maximum energy. Okay, where does the rest go? Because in a disintegration, a certain amount of energy has to, get, has to leave the nucleus. Okay, so if the maximum energy is not emitted, where does the rest go? That's the job of the neutrino. Okay, so the energy of the neutrino, or antineutrino, is the maximum energy minus the energy of that electron or positron that just got emitted. Okay, so the electron or positron comes out of the nucleus, 
say it comes, ha it comes out with half of the maximum energy of that disintegration, then the rest of that energy the neutrino is going to take. Okay? That's, a, that's a neutrino's job. Okay, example. Beta minus decay example. So we've got uh, uh, phosphorus. Phosphorus 32, radioactive phosphorus. It's got a Z of 15. What does it decay to? If it's a beta minus decay, what does it decay to? It's going to emit, it's going to emit a, an electron. What does it decay? So if it emits an electron, does a neutron convert to a proton, or does a proton convert to a neutron? neutron. Right? So it's going to lose a... So a neutron converts to a proton. Is the name going to change? No. It's not? Yeah, but yes. yes. Yeah. It always changes. Because it either gains a proton or loses a proton. Okay, so is the Z going to go up or down? Z is going to go up. Okay. It's going to go up because we're gaining a proton. Okay, A, does it stay the same or? A is the same. It stays the same. Okay, so Z goes up by one, so Z is now 16. What is, you guys know what? <laughs> sulfur. Huh? Yeah, good one. Okay, so it becomes sulfur because you have a, you have electronauts. Okay. Okay, hey, sir. Hi, Jenny. Come on. We're just talking about radioactivity, CK. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Sulfur, 16, you got it. Beta minus decay and a neutrino. Anti neutrino, rather. Okay, and the maximum energy of this disintegration is uh, 1.71 MeV. So, uh, what's the energy of this beta? What, what's the energy of the beta? The answer is you don't know. Yeah. I didn't give you enough information. Okay, it's a spectrum, remember, it could be any energy. If I ask you what's the maximum energy, then that the answer is 1.7. Okay? Does that make sense, Sarah? I think so, yeah. Okay. No. I'm just saying that it could be any any energy between the maximum energy and zero. All right, so P32, by the way, is used to alleviate this disease uh, called polycythemia vera by reducing. Now, polycythemia vera patients that have this produce tons of red blood cells and just keep producing red blood cells. And they inject P this radioactive P32 into the, um, usually into the cavity where these red blood cells are being produced and it suppresses the amount of um, RBCs. It's also used in this, in this um, device called a Galileo guided intravascular brachytherapy device. Intravascular means inside a vessel, right? Um, brachytherapy means we're gonna take radiation and put it inside. Brachytherapy means internal radiation. And, uh, and we're going to put it inside the patient. So for a while, this was very popular. It's not popular anymore. For a while, you know, there's a disease, a coronary ar ar artery disease uh, called restenosis. And that's when one of your coronary arteries uh, is clogged up. And the cardiologist goes in and cleans it out. And then it clogs up again. And that's called restenosis. So what we used to do is we used to go in the, in the OR with the cardiologist and bring this radioactive material and they would put it, they'd run a catheter into their femoral artery, go up, they, and you could watch it under x-ray. So they'd, they'd run this thing up and they'd run it into this coronary artery that's blocked, and they'd run this radioactive substance and leave it there for a certain amount of time, and it would irradiate all the area around it. And because it's beta, and it was, um, because it's beta, it stopped too penetrating. Okay, uh, Radioactive material that that has mass or has charge interacts very readily with other material because of the Coulombic effect and mass effects. So it didn't penetrate too far. So it just treated that the inside wall of that vessel. And what, the way that what was happening there is that we were we were killing off all the little stem cells that would otherwise grow and become scar tissue. So that scar tissue didn't grow. That's how that worked. So over the years, um, people did a lot of research into into other ways of doing this because it was a bit of a scheduling nightmare because you have to get a cardiologist, radiation oncologist, the physicists all into OR. So what they've developed today is these drug eluding stents. So now they're putting a stent into the coronary artery, they're opening up the stent, it's like a little metal cage, and that's coated, that cage is coated with antibiotics. And that also kills the stem cells that create the scar tissue. So we don't go to OR anymore with the cardiologists because they've come up with something a lot simpler. So anyway, half-life of P32 is 14.3 days. Okay, it decays pretty quickly. And usually things that have a short half-life are pretty radioactive. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask, like, 
the medical properties come from interacting with the beta particle, right? So does the like the neutrino or the anti-neutrino ever come into play, or no? And anti-neutrinos and neutrinos don't interact with anything. I mean, they're barely detectable. There's the only way you can detect neutrinos are these are these labs that are buried miles underground. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of these, but they're they're just huge vats, billions of millions of gallons of uh, scintillating material. And what they do is they're there is a way that these neutrinos interact with the scintillating material. And scintillating material means material that, that uh, creates light when it interacts, and uh, and so they go. So the only thing that can penetrate that depth are neutrinos. They create this light, and that's they can distinguish a neutrino between another particle. And I mean, they detect very few neutrinos. So neutrinos do not interact with us or pretty much nothing else. So yeah, the, the betas are where, where interact with the tissue. And you know, and in general, they interact with the cell, and they they affect the cell's ability to multiply. You'll learn this in radiation biology. They affect the ability of the cell to multiply. So if it can't multiply, it can't grow. Okay, so that's how we stop the scar tissue. Um, so and then down at the low, down below, so p thirty two can penetrate down to two point eight millimeters of aluminum. Okay. So some decay scheme examples. Uh, this is on the next slides. And we're going to look at cobalt-60, and cobalt-60 is used as a radioactive material used in teletherapy machines. Uh, you got, did you see some a LINAC yesterday, a linear accelerator? Did you see that yesterday? And so a linear accelerator is, um, we, that radiation is created by, it's, it's created by a machine, it's not radioactive, okay? Cobalt-60 is a radioactive material, and there's still a couple of cobalt-60 machines around, but not that many. So we treat, it's kind of like a linear accelerator, to, in other words, it's used to treat patients for cancer, but it's but there's a cobalt-60 source up in the head of the machine instead of uh, electrons and photons uh, made, by, um, made by the linear accelerator. Cesium-137 is found in some, also some older teletherapy machines. Excuse me, now mostly used for low dose rate gynecological brachytherapy. So we still use 137 for gynecological brachytherapy. And I-131 is used for thyroid ablation. We do this pretty, we do this every week in our department. And um, I-131, and we, it comes in little pills, little radioactive pills. And the patient swallows these pills, and iodine goes to the thyroid. Okay, the thyroid is like an ion sponge. It's like an I-130 iodine sponge. It soaks up iodine. Um, and since this iodine is radioactive, it soaks up radioactive iodine and treats the thyroid. Okay, and these are for patients that have thyroid that are very active or thyroids that are cancerous. Okay, so they take this thyroid. And the energy of I-131 is 364 kV. The half-life is eight days. And it has a lot of different gamma energies. So these are some decay schemes. Okay, so let's let's go over these again. This is cobalt-60. Uh, you'll see, up here you'll see the half-life. Usually it's either Y means years, D, D, D is days, and S is seconds. Uh, and then that decays to, sorry, you can't see my mouse too well. Okay, that decays to a beta minus. Remember how I said on the right hand side we're gonna uh, we're gonna gain protons. I said the, if if you see a decay scheme that goes to the right, you're gonna gain protons. If it goes to the left, you're gonna you're gonna lose protons in the nucleus. Okay, so that's just a, a rule. It's just a convention that, that we use. So uh, it decays by two two types of betas. There's one. The most common one is this one here. Ninety nine percent of the time it decays in this. By this mode, maximum energy is 0.32, and then 0.1% um, of the time it decays in this way. So most of the time, after cobalt decays, you'll see, uh, right after that, you'll see a gamma that, is, that has an energy of 1.17, and then another gamma that has 1.33, and then that decays down to nickel 60. Okay. So in that over a period of five years, it will get down to half of its original activity. So this is what we treat our patients with, these two, these two gammas. And the effective energy of those two gammas is 1.25 MeV. Okay. Um, just so you know how penetrating that is, the half value layer, which is how much, how much lead do you need to reduce half of the intensity? That's the half value layer. We're going to get into that too. So for cobalt-60, it's about a centimeter. Okay, you need a centimeter of lead to reduce half of the intensity of cobalt-60. Okay, that's quite a bit. So it's pretty penetrating stuff. Okay, cesium-137 decay, again, beta minus goes to the right, so we're gaining protons in the nucleus, 
We're gaining a proton, we're losing a neutron. So the first one is a 0.5 MeV, the second one is 1.174 MeV, and this decays down to barium, which has a half-life of two minutes. Look at cesium, look at the half-life of cesium, 30 years. That's, that's actually why cesium became so popular for, for, uh, for treatment, because you could buy cesium, these sources, and you could keep them around your clinic for you know, 10, 15 years, and you haven't even hit a half-life, and you can use them over and over. So the activity is, you know, over 30 years, the activity is half of what it was uh, when you bought them. But over 10 years, it's a lot. Uh, you're not losing that much. Okay, so there's still viable sources. There's still sources that can be uh, easily used. What happens over th after 30 years? Your activity is half of what it was when you bought them, which means that they have to stay in the patient twice as long because you want to give the same dose. Okay, so after 30 years, your treatments are twice as long. Okay, which is not the end of the world. You know, we still use. We still have some services. I don't think they're 30 years old, but they're probably 20 years old, and we still use them. You know, the treatments are just a little longer. Okay. Okay, look at that. Another one. This is one, this one's a little more complicated. I was 31. You guys remember what this was for? The thyroid. Thyroid, right. Thyroid ablation, hyperactive thyroid, uh, those little pills that they that they uh, they take. So look at how complicated that is. Whole bunch of betas, whole bunch of gammas. Okay, so it's kind of it's like junk radiation. There's all kinds of energies coming out of there. The average, usually though, they'll, they'll give you an average energy of that, that substance. And I-131 is around 385 kV. Uh, okay, and then isotope reduction. So some, some isotopes are natural, they're mined, like radium, that's natural, you can mine radium. But most isotopes we use today, where do they come from? Well, they come from two main places. One is a reactor and one is a linac. So, the reactor produces probably the cheapest, the cheapest way of making um, a radioactive material. And the, the way a reactor produced works is nuclei that are bombarded by neutrons from fission, from the fission process within the reactor. In the reactor, there's a lot of neutrons, okay, due to the fission process. So you could put a substance in the reactor, bombard it with neutrons. Now you're injecting neutrons into the nucleus, okay? So you're putting a lot of neutrons in, you're making it unstable. But if you're putting a lot of neutrons in, what do you think this atom wants to do? It wants to convert the neutrons to protons. Okay? So to convert neutrons to protons, it's going to emit what? Beta minus. Okay, it's going to beta. So mainly reactor produced um, radionuclides are beta minus decay. Okay? They have an excess of neutrons. So LINAC produced are the opposite. LINAC produced, um, you put a substance in a, in a linear accelerator. You accelerate protons, and you bombard the substance with protons. Now you have an excess of protons. And what happens? You're going to emit positrons to decay. Okay? These are a little bit more expensive. More expensive than a reactor produced, therefore very few of these around. So there aren't too many of these around. Then there's a cow produced, though, right? So now there's a, these aren't as common anymore. Back in the old days, there were a lot of cows around, right? So you've seen cows, right? Milking the cow. Yeah, milking the cow. So what's a cow? Okay, so a cow is... Besides the thing that runs around in the field and eats grass, and uh, uh, a cow is is mostly mostly refers to a technetium cow, and what they do is they take the substance called molybdenum ninety nine and they put it in this cow, and then molybdenum ninety nine decays down to technetium ninety nine m. Okay, and it takes a certain amount to decay, a certain amount of time to decay, and so so that what they do is they milk it at a certain time. And they take it all out, and then there's no more technetium 99M, and they have to wait for more of that molly to decay down to technetium 99M. And they wait, they wait, and they milk it again. Okay. So today, in the old days, the nuclear medicine departments had these right in the department. They would just milk it. In. Did you did you ever milk cows? No, but I've oh. seen. Okay. Yeah, literally yes. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Real cows, okay. Yeah. Not these cows. Not these cows. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, but today most people I think just order them from radionuclide companies that make these. So anyway, the nice thing about technetium 99 m it's a very nice radionuclide for treating, um, for actually it's for imaging, I should say. Um, this, this radionuclide is injected into the body, and it emits a certain energy of a photon, and it goes, and they can label this, what I mean by label, they can attach this radioactive material to certain substances that go to certain parts of the body. Okay, so you can inject this stuff, and it'll go to the liver, or it'll go to the heart, or it'll go to 
different areas of the body, and you can image that. And nuclear nuclear medicine physicians then use these special imaging cameras that look at this where the, where the radiation is coming from, and it gives them information about how well this thing is functioning. So, for example, a heart. They want to see if a patient comes in with heart trouble. They'll inject this. It will go to the heart, and they can image the heart. And if they don't, if it doesn't look like a normal heart, then they, they can say, well, this part, it looks like this part of the heart has died, you know, because maybe a coronary artery was, was occluded. So they use tech, technetium 99 for imaging studies mostly. They don't use it for treatment. The nice thing about technetium is it has an energy, a pretty low, a low energy gamma, sorry, um, yeah, pretty low energy gamma, which is easily shielded. Okay, so you can put them in, in a room that can, you can easily shield because it's got low energy. The other nice thing, too, is the half-life is only six hours, which means that after the patient uptakes the stuff, in six hours, half of it's gone. Okay, in 12 hours, a quarter of it's gone, a quarter of it's left. Okay, so it decays very quickly, which is good because you don't want to inject somebody with, with a substance that has a you know, 10-year you know, half-life. They're going to be radi walking around radioactive for, you know, for a long time. So that's a nice, it's a nice radionuclide. Okay, and there's a de decay scheme of technetium 99. Okay, so tech is used for imaging, as I said, and so it starts up here at Molly 99, half life is 66 hours, and uh, it decays by two processes. This one up here, which is a uh, beta. Let's see, let's just say beta minus. That looks like a beta plus, because it's on the right. But anyway, it decays down to here, and then there's a there's a gamma emitted. Here's the gamma that's a six-hour half-life. Okay, and then there's another gamma down here. Um, and there's the energy 0.142. This is MeV. So if you multiply by 100, it becomes sorry by 1,000, it becomes KeV. Okay, and uh, and then it decays down. Then technetium 99. And this is the metastable state is this one, and then the stable state is down here. Technetium, and it's it's not stable because it's, it still needs to decay down to rubidium 99 here. Okay, we'll look at this halfway. Okay, uh, let's see what else can I say about that. Let's see. Okay, oh yeah, the energy here. Uh, energy 0.92, uh, this is considered energy of zero, and then this is uh, energy 0.29 MeV, and as you go higher, let's see, these energies should increase. 0.29, that's the energy of the beta. Uh, yeah, they should go up. I have a better, a better decay scheme somewhere. And we'll talk about that at the end of class. Okay, electron capture, slide 23. What, how many slides do I have? 37, 38? 38. 38, okay. Working. You know what, let's take a break right here. Five minute break, and then we'll go on. Okay. And you guys can ask me questions. You can... All right, so the third mode of decay is electron capture decay. And that's, that sounds like, uh, that, that mode of decay is easy to remember because of it's, it happens exact, exactly like the name says. It captures an electron. So the nucleus goes out to one of the orbitals and pulls an electron. And it's usually a K-shell electron. Okay, so the, the decay, I really need to get an optical mouse, uh, a wireless mouse or something. Um, the, the decay scheme is right there, that decay equation. So it starts with an element X, and this element X, uh, the nucleus, pulls in an electron from the orbital, and this K indicates that it comes from the K shell, and then that element then becomes, um, then now Z drops by one because one of the protons becomes a neutron, okay, so it converts, a, converts it to a neutron. A stays the same, and so now we have an element that's got a different name and a different number of protons, one less, and it also emits uh, a neutrino. So uh, occurs where there's not enough energy for beta decay. Huh? What's that? Wireless. Is that wireless? Yeah. Oh. oh, that'd be great. Just, yeah, just, I'll just plug it in. Just because I, if I can keep it here, I wonder if it'll reach I forgot reach what I had here. it with me. I wonder if it'll reach here. Are you using it, Sargon? No, I'm not using it now. But... Okay, let's see. Let's see. My mouse, where are you? Do I have to push on? No, no, it's on already. It's on. It it should be different. Sometimes it takes a little bit. Yeah. Okay, we'll give it a couple minutes. All right. So it occurs when there isn't enough energy 
to decay uh, through beta. And then it does an electron capture decay. It doesn't require as much energy. So the orbital electron is captured by the nucleus and creates a neutron from a proton and then ejects a neutrino. A hole is left behind. So if you pull an electron in from the K-shell, now you've got a hole in an orbital. What happens when you have a hole in an orbital? What's a common occurrence? It's filled. Gets filled, right, by, by another electron from another upper. And once it gets filled, what happens? Energy release. There's energy release in the form of? Gamma. Characteristic X-rays. Characteristic. Gamma only comes from the nucleus. OK, so gamma rays come from the nucleus. Uh, and X-rays come from, characteristic X-rays come from orbitals, from the, the, the um, uh, holes being filled from electrons and the difference in energy. Uh, and then it also comes from another process which we'll talk about in, in another lecture. So a hole is left behind an orbital can cause further characteristic X-rays. If all the energy is not given up by pulling an electron in, the remainder is given off as a gamma. Okay, so remember disintegration has to give off a certain amount of energy. Okay, so it pulls an electron. If that's not enough, then a gamma is emitted after that. Okay, so sodium-22 is an example of that. There's an electron capture process right here. So sodium-22, remember, it goes to the left. So if it goes to the left, we're going to uh, lose a proton. So an electron capture, it was 10% of the time. This one here is a beta plus positive charge to a 0.54 MeV. That's the most common, 90% of the time. And then here's one that's not very common. I, I cut that off by mistake, but uh, that's not that common. So the most common is this one, and then after sodium decays down to this metastable state, and then it's a, a gamma of 1.27 MeV. Okay? So if you have sodium 22, the energy, the um, particles that you're going to see are positrons and gammas coming off of it mostly. Okay, and the half life is 2.6 years. Okay? Okay, process number four is internal conversion. And in internal conversion, the nucleus is in, a, in an excited state. Okay, obviously, it's a radioactive material. Then the nucleus loses energy through the ejection of a gamma. Okay, so, um, so a gamma comes off the nucleus. Okay, so a gamma is a photon. It has no mass. It's just got energy. Okay, or the ejection of an orbital electron. So in internal conversion, two things can happen. The gamma comes off the nucleus, gets ejected from the nucleus, and leaves the, the atom. Okay? And then it goes off to do whatever it wants to do. Or that gamma interacts with an orbital electron. And that orbital electron gets ejected from the shell. Those two, those two processes can happen in internal conversion. And so uh, even though an electron is ejected, the internal conversion process does not convert a neutron to a proton that's in beta decay. Okay, so the ejected electron is not a beta since there's no beta decay. It's not considered uh, a beta decay electron. And the energy of the electron that gets emitted is the energy of the gamma that comes off the nucleus minus the BE is binding energy. That's the binding energy of the K-shell. Okay, you know that electrons are held in their orbitals by a certain amount of energy, and it takes energy to pull them out of there, right? That's the binding energy. Okay, so it's, it's the gamma minus the binding energy of the electron. And internal conversion can occur in any shell, A, L, M, et cetera. But the K-shell conversions are more common. Let's see if the mouse works. Ah, ah, look at that. A little sensitive. OK, so K-shell conversions are more common. And then there's this thing, this, this factor called total internal conversion yield. And um, students have a lot of trouble with this. And every year, I try to make the slides a little more clear because it's a little confusing. So total, total internal conversion yield is equal to the number of conversions in any shell, okay, K, L, M, et cetera, divided by, now what's a conversion? Conversion is when a gamma interacts with an electron. Okay, it gets converted to an electron. Number of conversions in any shell divided by the number of gammas observed leaving the atom. So those are the ones that don't get converted. Okay, it's the number of converted divided by the number of ones that don't get converted. That's internal conversion yield. So the number of gammas observed refers to those that are not converted and leave the atom. Okay, so in text, they'll say the internal conversion yield is the number of observed. It's not the ones, it's, the people get confused because they think, is that the ones that exit the nucleus? No, it's the ones that actually exit the atom, that don't interact with the electron. Okay, because the ones that exit the nucleus might interact with an electron. So IC yield can be greater than one if many more electrons are ejected compared to the number of gammas observed. 
All right, look at that. So here's an example of a, let's see how far I can go with this mouse. Here's an example of a case scheme where, the, where there's internal conversion happening. Okay. All right, so um, cesium-137, very common radioactive material we use in, in radiotherapy, can decay by either uh, this beta minus or this beta minus. Most commonly, it'll be this one. Maximum energy of that interaction is 0.541 MeV. Then it goes to this metastable state and decays by either this gamma that leaves the atom completely, okay, with an energy of this much, 662. And that happens 85% of the time. Or there can be this internal conversion with L and M shell electrons or this internal conversion, okay? So the gamma interacts with an electron in that shell and ejects an electron, okay? So what, what's the energy of these electrons, by the way? Let's see. It's probably pretty low. 662, um, 0.54 MeV. Okay, this is 1.17. So the energy difference from here to here is 1.176, because this beta decays all the way. Okay, that's how you know what the energy difference is. Okay. Uh, let's see. Does that, does this and this add 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 662 is, is 1.1. 1.76, yeah. So if you add this energy plus this energy, you get 1.176, okay? So in the case schemes, the energy difference between here and here is gonna equal the, uh, the sum of the energies of the decaying particles. So, all right, so internal conversion, so let's see, K-shell internal conversion. So if there's an internal conversion that comes from the K-shell, um, that, what do you think? Can we calculate the energy of that emitted emitted electron? Well, we have to know what the binding energy of the K-shell is, right? Because we know that the, if it gets converted with the K-shell, the energy of that gamma is 662 uh, keV interacts with the K-shell electron, so that electron is going to have 662 minus the binding energy of, of that K-shell, all right? And same thing here. Uh, this electron, this internal conversion electron is going to be 662 minus the binding, binding energy of the L or M. Which one, which electron is going to have the most energy? This M electron or this K electron? M, because the binding energy of the M shell is going to be the least. All right, so it loses the least amount of energy. Okay. So here's an example. 94.6% of all disintegrations, these here, this disintegration right here, uh, occur through a beta that results in an isomeric state. Of these, 85% of, of these, 85% of those are going to be gammas. And 78% will emit a K-shell electron through internal conversion, and 1.8% will emit either L or M. Okay, so just, I like, to, I like to make this example so you guys see how all the numbers work out, okay? So 85% plus 78% plus 1.8 is 94.6, okay? So you add up all these numbers and you get 94.6. And so, and then the total internal conversion yield is 7.8 plus 1.8, take both per percentages, divided by um, the, the number of, remember how in this side set, I said the number of gammas observed is in the denominator, that's what that is, 85%. So the internal conversion yield is 0.113, okay? Examples of that, so in the first one, example one, if the IC, is 0.14 in an asymmetric transition, and there are 10 electrons emitted, how many gammas will be ejected from a cesium-137 atom? So I solve for x, the number of gammas emitted. So remember the equation, number of electrons converted divided by the number of gammas observed. That's what we want to know. That's equal to the IC. Okay, just solve for x, 25. Another example, and I'm going to try to leave these. Once we get into those new classrooms with the smart boards, what I can do is I can project this onto the smart board and write on here, and it will record it okay, onto the PowerPoint. So that's why there's a big gap this year because of the, the future smart boards. Example two, if the IC is 4.4 and there are 100 isomeric transitions, how many gammas and how many electrons would be emitted from the atom? Okay, so uh, Y is the number of electrons converted, X is the number of gammas. Okay, we know that X plus Y is 100. So how do we solve this? So equations to unknowns. So x plus y equals 100. And x, is it x over y? No, y over x. y over x 
equals 0 0.4. Okay. Well, we can just we can say x is equal to 100 minus y. Okay, put that in here. y over 100 minus y equals 0 0.4. Cross multiply y equals 0 0.4 times 100 minus y, and then which is equal to uh, 40 minus 0 0.4 y. Okay, bring the y over. So y plus 0.4 y equals 40, and then y times 1.4 equals 40, y equals 40 over 1.4, which is what? 29. 29? Yeah. Okay, so y is 29. Okay, so y is the number of, y is the number of electrons converted, okay? Mouse, okay. That's the problem with the wireless mouse, you gotta, you gotta find it. Okay, the next one, auger electrons. Okay, have you guys heard of auger electrons? I think I put it on that in my undergrad. How do you pronounce it, auger or OJ? OJ. OJ? That's how I learned it, OJ. And then I moved to, to the US from Canada and everyone said auger. Anyway, auger electrons. After a hole, a vacancy is created in an atom due to an injection of an orbital electron. So. An example of this would be an internal conversion when an orbital electron is ejected. Okay, there's a, there's a vacancy. A characteristic X-ray is given off as an upper electron fills it. Okay, why is it called a characteristic X-ray? Why is it characteristic? Because it's characteristic to that atom. The energy that's ejected from a characteristic X-ray um, is characteristic to that, to the, the energy differences between the orbitals. Okay, so it's, it's a, that atom's fingerprint. Uh, so subsequent electrons ejected by these characteristic X-rays are called auger electrons. Okay. So if I was to draw a picture of that, it would look like this. Here's the nucleus. K shell, L, and M. All right. So there's a vacancy in the K from electron capture, for example. The L shell electron drops in to fill it. As it drops in, the energy... There's an X-ray emitted, a characteristic X-ray. What's the energy of this X-ray, by the way? What do you think it is? The difference in the binding energy. Exactly. So the energy of the X-ray is equal to binding energy K minus binding energy L. Okay, that's it. So that energy then goes off, and that X-ray, sorry, then goes off and interacts with another electron in the M-shell and ejects that electron. And this little guy has a name. It's an auger electron. Okay. So it's a special case of, a, of an electron. All right, so the energy of the ejected electron from the auger, sorry, the energy of the auger electron is equal to H nu. Whenever you see H nu, this is Planck's constant times the frequency of the radiation. This just means the energy of a photon, whenever you see that. So the energy of this photon the characteristic X-ray minus the binding energy of the M-shell, of this M-shell up here, is equal to the energy of the auger electron. And the fluorescent yield, this is another factor that you need to know, uh, and it's denoted by W sub K. W is equal to the, the K-shell X-rays observed. Okay, so how many of these, of these X-rays are observed divided by the number of K-shell vacancies, divided by the number of this. So why would this why would this not be the same? Because not all of these X-rays leave the atom; they get converted by they get converted to augers. Okay, so that's called a fluorescent yield. And as the atomic number goes up, the fluorescent yield also goes up. Okay, now fluorescent yield means that there's going to be so here. Let's answer this question: Does fluorescent yield increase or decrease with more augers? What do you think? It decreases, yeah, because okay. you're going to see more X-rays if there's less augers. Okay, and if you think of the name fluorescent yield, it's fluorescent, it's light, it's X-rays. So there's more fluorescence, there's more X-rays. Okay. Okay, and then here's a here's a a pictogram of internal conversion on the production of auger electrons. Internal conversion is apparent. You know, there's a certain number of neutrons and a certain number of protons, and the case shell with Guess how many electrons in the K-shell? Two. It's got to be two. Okay, so 
Uh, uh, gamma ray is emitted from the nucleus, and we lose, we're going to lose a neutron here, so a neutron gets converted to a proton. Okay, and then that gamma ray interacts with the K-shell electron, emits the K-shell electron, and then there's a hole left in the K-shell. Then that hole uh, then creates characteristic X-rays because the electron above it fills it. So this is what I just went through. There's the energy of the characteristic X-ray, and then that ejects an auger, and this is called an auger electron, and augers are they're given names. This is called a KLM, okay, because augers can start somewhere else. I mean, they could be an LMN auger too, or it could be a K, it could be a KMN auger, okay? There could be different shells there. So this is, in this case, this is a KLM. And then there's the final state, okay? That electron. This is our new logo, by the way. A new university logo. They went from, they used to be a very colorful logo and they got rid of all the colors and now it's all, now it's uh, monochrome. Okay, radioactive decay. Okay, so those are the different modes of radioactivity. We covered alpha, did you, were you here for alpha? No, you missed alpha, alpha decay. Uh, I'm not. Oh, is it? Okay, alpha decay, beta decay, internal conversion, and uh, electron capture, okay? And so those are the different modes of decay. Now, what hap what's radioactive decay? So now let's look at the time aspect of radioactive decay and some, some terms that we use. Uh, lambda is called the radioactive decay constant. You're going to see this over and over. So lambda, typically, people just call it the decay constant. And the definition of lambda is equal to natural log of 2, okay, divided by the half-life of the material. Okay? So natural log of 2, you're going to remember, is 0.693. If you don't have to put it in your calculator, just remember it's 0 0.693 divided by the half-life. So if something has a really long half-life, like radium, radium's got a really long half-life, um, this is going to be this is going to be very small, okay. And something that's got a short half life, so some a radioactive material that decays very quickly and is very radioactive, has a short half life, and therefore um, gamma is going to be very large. La sorry, lambda is going to be very large. Okay, so for large lambdas, think of anything that has a large lambda. It's it's very hot. It's very radioactive. Okay. Okay, um, uh, half-life is equal to the time, we already mentioned this, for radio nuclei to decay to half of its original activity, okay? Another term you'll hear is the mean life. The mean life is the half-life divided by 0 0.693, which is also 1 over lambda. Okay, if you look at the equations. Okay, it's just the inverse of this. All right, and so what is mean life? Why do we use this? Well, it, we use it sometimes to, to um, for certain hypothetical situations. And it's defined as the average lifetime for the decay of radioactive atoms, which is also equal to the time for an imaginary source at constant activity to produce the same number of disintegrations as a natural source. Okay, so what does that mean? If you had a source, hypothetical source, that doesn't decay, okay? And then you take the same source that does decay, right? So, um, so how the, the mean life is how long this hypothetical source would would take to decay uh, for the same number of atoms. And let's see, let's see if I can make a picture of this. So here's a, here's the source, and here's time. A graph I'm drawing a graph of time, and this is um, activity of the source. And typically, sources decay exponentially. Okay. So here's a, a normal source, and then here's a Here's a hypothetical source that doesn't decay. The activity is constant. Okay, so if you take all the disintegrations for this source forever, that's basically the area under this curve, right? The number of disintegrations. And you look for the area under this curve that corresponds to the area under this curve. So say this is an area um, A naught. Okay, so you look for A naught, an equivalent A naught which may be this, I don't know, could this not? and that time, that's the mean life. How long that would take to, how long that would take, how long this hypothetical source would take to produce the number of disintegrations that this real source would take, okay? That's what the mean life is. All right, All right now how do we get the decay equation? Now we, we're gonna, at the bottom of the screen, we're gonna, we're gonna derive the most common equation that you folks are gonna use. So. We're going to start the decay equation 
by assuming that the decay rate of a radioactive material, how quickly it disintegrates, is proportional to the number of atoms present in a sample. All right, now think about that, why that makes sense. That makes sense because if you have one atom and it's decaying, it's producing disintegrations, and then you've got two atoms, it's producing twice as many disintegrations, three, three times as many. Okay, so the decay rate, so how many disintegrations per second, obviously has to be proportional to how many atoms you have. Okay, because the more atoms you have, the quicker the rate, the disintegration rate is. Okay, so that's what this first equation is, that the rate of uh, number of atoms divided by time, number of disintegrations per time is proportional to the number of atoms that you're starting out with. Okay, so we're going to equate that, so anything that has a proportion, proportionality, we can equate it with a constant proportionality, and convert this proportion to an equation, to an equal sign. And we're also going to say that it's negative, because we know that if something decays, there's less after a certain period of time than at the beginning. Okay, so after time goes by, there's less of the substance, because it's going to decay. Okay? A radioactive material, um, as, as it, um, as it uh, generates energy and generates uh, electrons and, and uh, photons, uh, there'll be less of that material, because that gets converted to something else. Okay, so the original stuff will disappear, but it'll get converted to something else. So there's less of that over time. Okay, so we're going to say it's negative. Um, also, there's another, another definition here. The activity is equal to the change in number of disintegrations per time. Okay, so it's the rate. So this is activity up here. Now we're going to rearrange this equation, and we're going to integrate it. All right, so we're going to bring the n down here. We're going to bring the dt up here. And we're going to integrate both sides of the equations, and we're going to start with a certain number n0, a certain number of atoms, and we're going to end up with another, another number of atoms. Okay? And then this side of the equation is going to be integrated from time 0 to time t, some time t. Okay, we're going to integrate the integral of 1 over n is natural log of n, and once you, this is a definite integral, so once you put these definite bounds in, you end up with log of n over n0 is equal to minus lambda t, okay? And then uh, we're going to rearrange this, and we're going to convert this natural log to an exponent, and rearrange it, and then we end up with n number of atoms is equal to the original number of atoms that we started with at time equals t, times the exponential of minus lambda t, okay? So t is a variable here. So over time, as t gets bigger, this n is going to get smaller. Okay? And so this just describes the behavior of a radioactive material, how many atoms you have over time. Okay? And then we're going to substitute n. So n is equal to the activity times lambda. Okay, it's another definition. We're going to substitute that into this equation. So now we have two equations. We have the number of atoms over a certain time after radioactivity, and we have also the rate. Activity is equal to uh, the initial activity times um, times the exponent. So these these equations will look very similar. Oh, by the way, if you if you want to know how to integrate something, let's see if this works. Click on this link. Let's see if it works. Oh, something's happening. And it'll take you to a website. Have you guys heard of um, Wolfram Math Mathematica? Okay, there's an online integrator. Have you seen that? Wolfram Alpha. Huh? Wolfram Alpha. It's called Alpha? I think so. Yeah, this thing right here. We're only Wolfram. Oh, this is the Mathematica portion. Yeah. So here's my example. The example I had, 1 over x. Integral of 1 over x is log of x. And uh, this thing's amazing. I wish I had this when I was a student. You could you could type anything in here, a crazy equation, and it'll like instantly integrate it for you. It's uh, so you, have you guys use this? Let's use the software suite. Yeah, like yeah. not the online one. Yeah, this is a, a neat little app. You know, you can put it as a shortcut if you do a lot of integrations on your browser. It's just the coolest thing, and it's free. Okay, so um, I just put that as a link, but you folks can probably Google it. Um, all right, so now let's do an example. How long does it take for a, 
for a sample to decay to one half of its original number, express your answers in terms of lambda. So just to, if we express it in terms of half-life, it's one half-life, right? So in terms of lambda, current lambda, what is it? What was the definition of lambda again? It was? Natural log of two over half-life. Yeah. So what's half-life in terms of lambda? Yeah, right. So we just, yeah, ln of 2 over ln of 2 lambda, okay? So half-life is equal to ln of 2 over lambda. Uh, a dose of P32 arrives, here's an example, like a practical example that we, we might see in the clinic. A dose of P32, phosphor 32, arrives at a hospital from a supplier on June 10th. Okay, so we get it on June 10th, right? Sargon's ordered in his nuclear department. And has a, it comes with a calibration. The calibration that's stamped on this on this radioactive material is 2.5 millicuries per milliliter on June 15th. Okay, so it's calibrated to five days ahead. Okay, that happens sometimes, and might calibrate to any day. You might say, I want to treat my patient on June 15th, but I want to get it in on I want to get it into my department on June 10th. So they'll calibrate it to the day that you treat your patient. So when it comes in, what's the activity on June 10th? And the half-life of that is 14 days. How would I do that? What equation would I use? Right? Okay. So lambda is lambda two over two and a half. What? Uh, I want to plug in numbers, right? So what numbers are we plugging? We're we're looking for we're looking for this, right? Activity on a particular day. Are we looking for this one? Yeah. Okay. We're looking for that one. Yeah. Okay. Because it's early in time. Is that why we're saying that? Okay. Okay, so what's that? Otherwise, your t would have right. To be negative. Otherwise, you can make this a plus. You can do that too. Or t is negative. Okay, so a is uh, 2.5 Okay. This is an unknown. What is it? So what is it, 0.693 over 14? Yeah. 0.693 over 14. Oh, D, always put the units, by the way. Anytime you write equations, especially when you give, when you hand in assignments, make sure you always put your units in. It's good for the person who's correcting, and it's, it's good for you too, because you'll find, you'll, you'll find if you get something that doesn't make sense, and you've got your units in there, it's a lot easier to um, investigate where your error was. Okay, so times T, I like this. Five. Okay, now luckily we've got the same units here. Because a lot of times I'll give you problems and I'll give you seconds here and I'll give you a half life, or I'll give you seconds here and your half life will be years. So you've got to convert that, okay? So I'll just watch out for that. All right, so what do we get here? Negative 0.247. 0.247? Okay, any units? Um, no. no units, okay. Then an argument, there's never any units in an argument, right? Okay, so um, can we do this? I need some pens. Okay, divided by? What is that? What does what is it come out to? Is it going to be a negative number? No. Okay. If this is one, what's this? If this is if the argument's one, what is? Uh, yeah. Well, positive. Well, this is positive one. Positive one. Uh, it'd be two point seven. Yeah. Yeah. Two point seven three something. Okay.
what you got. Yeah, my computer kind of Oh, it doesn't. Okay. So let's see. Um, something to the power. Something to the power of a half is is a square root, right? So something to the power of uh, a quarter is uh, less than that. I don't. Know, I can't do it in my head. Sorry, Yeah, a quarter. One point three. One point three? Is that in the denominator? Right, that's the actual exponent. E to uh, 0.693 divided by fourteen times five. That's E. So A is times A times one point three. I just count this is one point three, this whole yeah. thing right here? Yeah. Okay, so this is correct. Is that right? Yeah, then you get the initial value about two point five divided by one point three. So it's two? 1.9. So 1.9? Yeah. What are the units? Okay. All right, so does that make sense? Always when you get when you get an answer, ask yourself, does this make sense? Do you expect a higher or lower activity? On the on the um, tenth. Higher or lower? Should be higher because it's earlier, right? Yeah. Okay, so if it's earlier, your activity is going to be, it's going to be higher, and so is it? No. <laughs> All right, uh, Something's wrong. I don't know if it's 1.3, sorry, I'll double check. I don't think it's 1.3. Yeah. Well, look, I don't know. See, that's the total of the exponent. The e to the power mm -hmm. is 1.3, that whole thing. Really? Is it negative? Did you put the negative in? Yeah. This has to be a little smaller. This has to be less than this. I mean, this has to be less than one. Yeah, I have point seven eight zero on the denominator. Okay. Yeah, this has to be less than one. This has got to be greater. It's got to. We got to end up with greater than two point five. Yeah. What is it? Zero point seven eight one. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, do you agree? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's high. So finally, where are we at? Three point two oh two. Three point two. All right. Well, that was a good example of a sanity check. After you get an answer, does it make sense? Does it have to be higher or lower? Always do that in your exams and assignments. Okay. Cool. Another example. One point one nine millicurie source has a half life of four days. A short half life. How many radioactive atoms exist in the source? All right. So um, one point one nine millicurie source. That's going to tell you how radioactive it is, and you've got a half-life. And from that, from just the activity, and from the half-life, you can tell how many atoms are in this source. Isn't that great? Okay. So let's do that. So we're going to use this equation, number of atoms in the source is equal to the activity divided by lambda. Okay, this is a useful equation. All right, and here's how you do it. So lambda... First, first we need lambda. So lambda is equal to, as defined before, a natural log of two over half life. Okay. And um, let's see, lambda. And then lambda I got from this half life. Okay. So 0 0.693 divided by four is 0.17. And here, be careful with your units now. The units of lambda are days to the minus one. Okay, not days. People, I'm just going to, every once in a while, I'm going to tell you where people mess up. And this is one of the places where people mess up. They forget to put the minus one, okay? So it's D, you can write D to the minus one, or one over D, or whatever you want. But make sure you get the units right. Okay, so that's equal to, wait a minute, this is the same thing. That's equal to that. Obviously, it's the same. Oh, no, no, here we go, here we go. Times, I just converted. I'm converting days to, um, to uh, seconds. So one day is 24 hours, one hour, 60 minutes, one minute, 60 seconds. Okay, so we want to convert to seconds. So now we've got lambda in units of seconds then minus one. Why do we want it seconds then minus one? Because we're talking about activity. What are units of activity? Decrees, uh, right, the centigrations per second. So we want, to go, we want to go to seconds if we're going to use activity. So number of atoms are equal to 1.19 millicuries. That's the activity. And that now I want to convert to Becquerel's, also known as DPS. So Becquerel is the same as a disintegration per second. 
So converting it, no curious, you guys have to remember this conversion factor, by the way. Uh, for me, it's easier to remember curious to 10 to the 10, because 10 for me is an easy number to remember. So I always remember how to convert, I always remember the one curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10 backgrounds. That's the easiest to remember. And then from there, then I, then I just change my conversion factor based on whether I have millicuries or whatever. So for me, that's easier. 10 to the 10 is easier to remember. So anyway, 3.7 times 10 to the 7, because we're dealing with millicuries now, uh, divided by uh, lambda, which we calculate up here in units of second. Isn't that great? All the units work out so that we end up with 2.24 times 10 to the 13 atoms. So this source has this many atoms in it. And if we wanted to, we can calculate how heavy it was, if we knew what, what, uh, what material it was, okay? Using Avogadro's number, okay? All right, here's an example. Oh, is this the last slide? Yeah. Okay, here's an example. Uh, okay, so a blank decay scheme could be anything up there. Okay, it doesn't matter what it is. Blank decay scheme, something's decaying. Tell me what those arrows represent. The first, sorry, I'm sure, which arrows? Tell me what these arrows represent, these three. Bing, bing, bing. Those are beta. Okay, beta, beta plus or beta minus? Beta minus. Beta minus, beta minus. thank you. What about these two? Gammas. Yeah. Gammas, okay. Um, okay, betas, we know what a beta is, right? It's an electron, it has mass, it has charge. Does a gamma have mass? No, no mass. Any charge? No, hmm? no charge. No it's a photon, so no charge. No mass, no charge. Okay, so we know what betas and gammas are. Um, this is considered a stable state. It's got zero MeV of energy. These betas are gonna start at, uh, oh, what's this number up here? 1.11 MeV, what does that represent? The difference. Uh, it's, yeah, it is a difference between what? The initial state and the first possibility. Right, right. it's also something else. It also represents something else. It's the energy of something. The beta? Yeah, it's the energy of the beta. But is it what is it the average energy, maximum energy? Because remember the betas, there's a spectrum of energies during beta decay. So it's the max? It's the max. Okay. So we know that this disintegration that goes from here to here, the maximum energy will be 1.11, but you might have other energies. Okay, you might have um, I don't know, it, this beta could be 0.5 MeV. Right? So what happens if it's 0.5? Where does the rest of the energy go? Neutrino. To which? Neutrino. Okay, <laughs> to the antineutrino, right. Here it goes to the antineutrino. All right, so this is 1.11. What's the energy of this guy? Because it's 1.59 decay between 3.75 and 2.1. So you're taking this plus this, the difference of these two, right? Okay, that's right. And then what about this one? Uh, 4.86. 4.86. So you're taking, let's see, you're taking this uh, 3.75 and you're adding 1.11, right? Correct. Okay. What about this energy? What's the energy of this gamma? Uh, 1.59. Yeah. So the difference between these two. And this one here is? Okay, now let's ask, let's ask us some questions. Based on the above decay, can the following occur always, sometimes, never, or cannot be determined? Uh, so from this, as this atom decays, will we ever see a 1.59 MeV gamma? Yes, sometimes. Right? Sometimes. So sometimes is the answer. So that's this one, right? It's not always and it's not never. Okay, will we ever see a 40 keV characteristic X-ray? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know yet. I know. Right. And we, yeah. Right. But it could happen, depending. Uh, 1.12 MeV beta minus. Yeah. Never. Never? Actually, yeah, we could because uh, if we fix the second or third beta, it can be anywhere in the spectrum. Those are both above the 1.12. So, so, yeah. So sometimes. sometimes. Correct. Correct. Uh, 4.8 MeV antineutrino. What was this? What was this? This drop from here to here, by the way. What was that? Uh, was it 4.86? Okay, 4.86. Can we see a 4.8 MeV antineutrino? 
Uh, how can we see that? Uh, do you have the which decay was just beta decay? This one here, okay. And the beta particle had so much snow energy from it. Right. How much energy would it have to have? Uh, like zero six seven. And what's that in kV? Uh, sixty kV. Sixty kV. Okay. So if you have a sixty kV beta, then you will see a four point eight energy Good. Three point seven five gamma. Can we see that? Mm -hmm. so yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. No. Well, if it can drop from the third to the second of the first, it can drop. No, it can't. It can't go from here to here. It can't. No. no. Otherwise, I would draw an arrow from there. There. Okay. So the answer is no. 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 So never. No, you wouldn't see that, right? Okay. Um. All right, so that's a good exercise. I think we all understand how that works. Okay, so any questions on this stuff? I'm going to stop the recording. Otherwise, the files get so big. <laughs>